line. Thanks to Dan Luters for that. And welcome once again to Mostly Photo Beta 2. This is 0 0.2, Lisa Bettany of MostlyLisa.com, our host. Hello, Lisa Bettany Hello, of MostlyLisa.com, our host. How are you? I'm fabulous. We are going to talk today. You know, last week we had a great time with Trey. Mm -hmm. But I should tell everybody that this isn't even the format of the show. We're just kind of playing with it right now, just messing it's around, because we know you like to talk about photography. We love hearing from you, your input and your thoughts, and we've been paying a lot of attention to what you liked and didn't like about last week, and we're going to do more of that. <laughs> I mean, more of what you liked. Yes. And less of what you didn't <laughs> less like. Less of what you didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> Episode one is up on YouTube. We uh, we will, you know, eventually see these to a podcast feed, but we're still working on the album art. Yes. Did you like getting, what we got? I, yeah, I do. I do. I really do. Uh, thanks to Lori LeBeau Walsh, our official. Should I show people the, uh, or is it like secret? I don't know. I've been cartoonified. For sure. Well, that's the first thing we do is uh, we get we get a picture of our host, and we turn that picture into a cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, that's done by Nitrozac and Snaggy, or is it Snaggy and Nitrozac? Nitrozac does the <laughs> actual art. And uh, let me open this up, and I'll show you uh, where we're where we're standing right now. Although this is not the final, final, final. So, and then once we get the Snaggy and Nitrozac. We sent it over to Lori LeBeau Walsh, who is our album art designer. Really very uh, great designer. She does great stuff. And she usually does a dozen different looks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're going to see right now is her comps. If it will open. I'm sure it will. Da oh, I have to download it first. I don't download my attachments. Ahead of time. <laughs> you had some thoughts on this, though. Did you not like it? No, I liked it. I liked it for sure. Yeah. Uh, somebody's asking, am I going to leave the show? Do you want me to? Because <laughs> I can if you want me to. Well, let me just roll. Wasn't my plan. <laughs> let me just roll into what, what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so to master the basics of photography, you need to master exposure. And the three main elements of exposure are ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. And I thought today we would focus on aperture and getting great shallow depth of field shots, which is something that I use in a lot of my photos. And it's a technique that you can use um, with almost any camera. And, you know, it's a great technique for... It is easier with a DSLR. It is easier with DSLR, but a lot of um, point and shoots have aperture priority mode. Right. And even, um, you know, even with an iPhone, you can get, um, you know, you can play with uh, with foc focal point. So we're going to talk about depth of field and mm -hmm. changing your focal point, changing your bokeh and changing your aperture. And we are going to get Ray Maxwell on in just a little bit because he's going to give us the science mm -hmm. behind all of this. Um, and you brought your camera gear. I did. So we're going to find out, we're going to start a, a new feature that will be, I hope, a regular every week. What's in your bag? What's in your bag? What's your bag, man? But first, <laughs> I did say I would show this, so there it is. I hate me. You look great. <laughs> I, could, I could really get rid of me. But there, that proves that I am, in fact, going to be in the show because we spent all that money on putting my ugly mug in it. <laughs> did you have one that you liked? There's different typefaces, different colors, mm. different backgrounds. I love this. Isn't that nice? Don't you like being cartoonified? Yeah, no, I do. It makes it, you know, I've I've watched Twitch shows for so long and to now finally to finally official. have my own little cartoon. Yay! I'm pretty happy. <laughs> I kind of like this one right here. Anyway, we'll let you pick. You get to pick. So once we get uh, album art and music, mm -hmm. I think we're close to having a show. We were. The reason I say the format is not exactly right is because we still haven't gotten the submissions from the photographers we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And we're still kind of workshopping it. Mm -hmm. Lisa sure. and I were talking at lunch. For instance, I think it'd be fun to get a great photographer on, look at his por or her portfolio while he mm -hmm. talks to us about how he does what they he does. I definitely want to. the main point to be um, inspiring people to shoot and a yeah. way that I get... A lot of inspiration is by looking at other photographers work and when you're starting um, 
you know, starting a career in photography, it's always good to look at what other photographers are doing and in a sense, like kind of emulate what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, like when I started, I had, you know, favorite sort of portrait photographers and I would look at the composition of their shots and, and even try to like copy it, like almost exactly and try to copy the lighting style or copying's okay when and you then, first start yeah out. when you start and then yeah. and then you sort of like even if i start out trying to copy a shot i'll end up with something completely different um because you know you have your own sort of eye and but it's it's a great way to start um start building your portfolio is to see what other people have in their portfolio and then try to sort of emulate that style and then find your own uh we also hope to do uh, photo uh, assignments with some prizes. Photo assignments, yeah. Uh, and photo walks. And photo walks. we got one coming up maybe in Austin. We haven't figured that we out haven't yet. figured that out. You know, <laughs> we may end up doing a photo walk to the Apple store to buy an iPad too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually, yeah. what's, that's what's happened to that Friday night is that we're I mean, going to go buy an that's iPad That's something too. that I'm really excited about, obviously, is having um, another another camera to explore and and shoot with i love the iphone as a camera to be honest oh I, do you do a lot of iphone pictures i mean oh obviously <laughs> i take thousands and thousands and thousands of yeah. of iphone where do photos. we see those do you upload those um they're on do you use instagram the, or anything i use like that? well i use camera plus oh, of course what am i thinking and you're on the the <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh cam pl dot us you, slash photog slash mostly lisa and that's i it. forgot the camera plus has a we have our site. own sharing site slash photog slash lisa or mostly mostly lisa, lisa. so um these are these are from your iphone oh my gosh that's not from your iphone it is yeah good lord <laughs> that's my view <laughs> that is spectacular yeah the iphone is not a bad camera i mean look at that sky yeah and the detail in the in the bridge and stuff, I can't believe that's with an iPhone. So these are are these all iPhone? These are all iPhone photos, yeah. And you're using uh, the Camera Plus app and the HDR. That was the HDR built in. This is the the sepia tone built in. These are all like I mean, my the main part uh, that I do in Camera Plus is all the effects. So, do you spec them out with Lightroom or something, or how do you how do you? Um, in Photoshop. You do I, it in Photoshop yeah, first. Actually, yeah, actually, I just wrote um a, an, a tutorial on. How I come up with the effects. It's on the tap tap tap. Oh, good. Blog. Oh, I'd love to um, see that. And we like I do a I did a Photoshop tutorial, and then we showed how it goes from Photoshop to code, and how actually our coder codes all the the magic into the how app. How does he do that? Oh, he's a magician. That's amazing. <laughs> he's a magician. Here, this one is a tilt shift. Yep. This is all on Camera Plus. Yep. Yep. You call it miniaturize. Yes. And then you, you after you miniaturize, you can choose the frame, and this is thick white. That is neat. Oh, that's pretty. This must be... Uh, that's Trafalgar Square, yeah. Oh, wow. And this is red scale, 45%. So you brought up the red a little bit. Well, and uh, with all our effects, you can... Um, sliders. We have sli intensity sliders, so you can... This is HDR. That's the London uh, Apple Store, I guess. I always go to the Apple Store wherever I you am. Know, they're always photo, they're always photo, <laughs> photogenic, aren't they? They are. They're really they demand to be. Look at this. Traveling is a great time. We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Now you cannot do depth of field with an iPhone, can you? Sure you can. Really? Sure you can. How? Um, actually, with um, even with a standard camera, you can tap and focus. So if if I was uh. taking. A picture of this cup. Here, I'll hold it for you. All right, there right. is your mug. And so I, I, I can use the camera and then tap and focus on the mug. Yeah. And then everything else is going to be blurry. Oh, great. So, I mean, that's the simple depth of field. That's depth of field. So depth of field is something, usually in the foreground, but doesn't have to be, is in focus. And, and something is out of focus. Well, let... let uh, I want to start just with um, with what aperture is. So aperture, yeah, think of aperture like like the pupil of a lens. So when you take a shot, um, the shutter opens and creates a hole that allows light to hit the sensor to capture the image. And the aperture affects the size of that hole. So the larger the hole, 
the more light gets in, the smaller, less light. I mean, you think about a pinhole camera, which is just a pinhole, and that's only very small. Very small, right? Now, one of the side effects of a pinhole camera is that everything is in focus. It's a right. very small aperture. So, um, and this is where things get a bit tricky. Um, aperture is actually measured in f-stops, and an f-stop is a fraction that indicates the diameter of the aperture. So 1.1 1. 1 is a narrow aperture. No, no, it's a, a wide a open wide. aperture. And yeah. 1.4 is a narrower. 1.8 is even narrower. Yes. 1.12, 1. 1.16, uh, 1 over 16. Those are more and more narrow. Yes, yes. So, um, so I'll give you, here's an example of a, some portraiture that Lisa did. And this is what you often see in a professional photographer immediately is depth of field. So the model is in focus, but the background is completely... Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's something that you can immediately do to make your photos um, look more professional is by shooting at a shallower depth of field, especially if you're shooting portraits. Um, because most likely your background elements are going to be quite distracting. Mm -hmm. And like in that case, um, the background was like, you know, a bunch of buildings. In that shot, um, it was a, actually a bus stop. I think he's sitting <laughs> at a bus stop. <laughs> but you don't know. And actually what you get is this great blue spill. Right. Like the, You don't see a bus stop. You see color. Yeah. So, um, so obviously when... When you're shooting a portrait, you want the most important element to be in focus. That's what depth of field does, is it draws the eye to the part of the photo that the photographer wants. Well, de depth of field is, is, the, is the amount of, the sh uh, of your shot that's in focus. Mm -hmm. So a shallow depth of field or small depth of field means that only a, a small portion is... The, pla in, the plane that's in focus. Right, is, and is, then the rest is, is, is blurry. Yeah. Um, so this this model usually you, you focus on the eyes, right? Is that usually I focus on the eyes? You have to be careful with with portrait photography that you don't go too shallow. Yeah, because their eyes are being focused, but her chin would be out of focus. Exactly, exactly. And and good. if you don't catch it, you can sometimes catch it on, on right on the eyelashes, and then the actual eye right. will be out of focus. But obviously, you can do um, amazing things. Um, bokeh shots are now. This is this is an example of bokeh, bokeh or bokeh. This I is, say bokeh. I, I say bokeh too. Yeah. It's, I think it, the Japanese, it's bokeh, but I don't know. This is grass. The grass is in focus. And then the dew, the dew drops or whatever are out of focus. So And they're giving us these little dots. <laughs> right? That's the bokeh right there. Um, bokeh actually refers to the out of focus areas in the image and the aberrations of the lens and the aperture shape create. The bokeh so circles. So that's, in this case, why they're round, because the aperture is round. Right. So you can get, um, you know, octagonal ones or, like, right. really round ones. And bokeh is determined by the focal length of your camera, the distance from your camera to the subject, and the distance from your subject to the background and your aperture. aperture. You know who could probably explain this <laughs> really well? And he's going to say that, oh, well, yes, but... But, yeah. <laughs> is Ray Maxwell. Ray is a uh, great friend from your hometown of Vancouver. Uh, he, of course, had his own show for a long time, Maxwell's House, on uh, the Twit Network. A uh, very talented photographer, and um, but also an expert in a lot of... In, he was a color scientist, mm -hmm. a uh, Photoshop whiz. So, And he can explain the science, if you will, of uh, Boca. So let me say hello uh, to Ray Maxwell. Hey, Ray. Hey, Leo, how are you doing? Uh, it's good. Do you know Lisa? Well, this is what I think is really funny. There's a number of things that are very complimentary in our photography background, but we're both Vancouverites and we've never met. <laughs> That's See, funny. I thought everybody in Vancouver knew one another. <laughs> There's only a million people in the lower <laughs> mainland. I don't know why we haven't met. Well, it's good for, uh, for uh, you to uh, meet now because we want to have you be a regular teacher on this show. Because Ray's really expert at uh, taking these complex subjects like depth of field, aperture, mm -hmm. and bokeh and explaining. So what did we get wrong, Ray? No, you're doing really well. No, it's <laughs> really fine. No, I'm, I'm sitting here going, hey, there's nothing left for me to explain. Well, well, first of all, let's, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about uh, this bokeh or bokeh yeah. thing. Why does that happen? 
Well, it happens because of what we call the circle of confusion. <laughs> well, I'm confused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what it means is uh, areas that are not in the sharp focal plane right. uh, will have a, will be uh, out of focus by the amount depending on the aperture setting and uh, and we'll have a halo around it. That and halo is caused the, by the. It's it's the, the shutter it's, blades. It's, well, the shape of it is controlled not by the shutter blades, but the aperture blades. Okay. Yeah. So the aperture and, aperture looks like. Um, is it that? Is yeah. that? Is that like a, a well, valve? Well, yeah, like the like the blades kind of come they kind in. of close and open. Like the eye, like an eye. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like you usually see them come in as a kind of spiral. Right. A bunch yes. of lines spiraling in on each other, and uh, that uh, where those blades meet then controls the shape of the aperture. Here's an example. These are uh, yeah. There you go. These are aperture blades. A little rusty aperture <laughs> <laughs> aperture blades. So, but is there kind of a standard shape these days? Are they always round or? Um, or no. They're, they're, and in fact, in the old days, uh, when you changed apertures, you actually rotated a disc with different size holes in it. Wow. And, and they were perfectly round. Some of the early, the really early view cameras and stuff, you, you actually rotated a plate with holes in it and, uh, in order to change the aperture. So here's an illustration. Uh, this is from the website uh, cs.mtu.edu mm -hmm. um, of a small aperture, very narrow, a medium aperture, and a large aperture. And there's those aperture blades that we were talking about. Right. So, so you set that independent of the shutter speed. It's yeah. complementary to it because as you open the aperture to let more light in, you have to increase the shutter speed to cut down the amount of time that you let light in. So there, uh, there's a reciprocity. And back in the old film days, uh, when you started making very long exposures, uh, you got what was called reciprocity failure. But the good news is digital cameras don't suffer from that. So that's one of the other advantages of digital cameras. Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, that lens has great bokeh or bokeh. Yeah, obviously longer lenses produce better bokeh. Well, okay, let me see if I can think about this now. The longer the <laughs> lens, that means the, the longer the focal length, mm -hmm. the better the bokeh. I get great bokeh for, on my 50 millimeter, though. Yeah. For, for a given uh, focal length, though, um that's covering a given area, if you're covering it with a longer focal length lens, you will have a shallower depth of field. I see. So, and the circle of confusion will grow in size, and that's what creates the bokeh. Now, the more blades, the more round the bokeh will be. This is a six-blade iris diaphragm, and you can see it does, in fact, have a hexagonal shape. Right. So those bokeh dots would, be, would look hexagonal with this camera. Right. More, a nine-blade iris is much rounder, as you can see on this Wikipedia illustration. Mm -hmm. That's pretty typical in a modern camera. And here's the one you were talking about. Yeah, there you go. There's a picture <laughs> and, of it. And um, obviously um, people, like uh, there's sort of a trend for shaping bokeh. I've so seen like Stars of David bokeh. Yeah, well, you can, I think I have some in my stream. Um but yeah, you can get, um, you can either create a cover for your lens and then uh, have cut out like a star or a heart or something like that. Um, actually, Lens Baby has right. a, a great sort of like a magnetic um, bokeh shaper that you can just put in inside the lens. Um, but bokeh is one of the most popular things on Flickr. People well, I've just searched for bokeh <laughs> and here's a Flickr slideshow of different kinds of bokeh. Most of these are round because they're mostly done with, um, without any special filters on modern cameras. Yeah. But it's, it's really just about um, getting something in focus and then the rest of the photo being, being out of focus. Right. 
And obviously, you know, if you have any sort of street lights, um, Christmas tree lights, those types of things can create really cool um, bokeh circles. The other thing we might point out is that the uh, size of the bokeh is proportional to the size of the aperture. Uh, and, uh, and the focal length affects this as well. But what I'm saying is the larger the apertures, in other words, the smaller the F numbers, uh, the larger the bokeh or the more that's going to be out of focus and the larger those circles are going to become. Right. So, so you want to have, um, you know, a lens that can go down fair to a fairly small aperture, um, you know, F 1.4 or even 1.8 is great. Um, so you're going to have, you know, a, a lot smaller bokeh if you're shooting with, say, a kit lens that only goes down to, you know, 3.5 or 5. I could um, see people get real confused with this because what we're going to say is you want a faster lens that is a lens that opens up wider, lets more light in. Yes, and so the 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 lower the number, mm -hmm. the the lower the denominator on the f stop, the Big. faster the lens, the bigger the iris, the better the bokeh. <laughs> yeah. Now, Leo, would you like me to explain where those numbers come from, or is that too deep? <laughs> no, I think that's interesting because it's as far. I mean, I can understand uh, when you talk about lens lengths, you're talking millimeters. That must be somehow the focal length must be tied mm. to the length right. of the lens. So I can understand that. But what is what is F1.2? What does that mean? Well, let me explain. If you had a lens that was F1.0, that would mean that the, di the effective aperture of that lens was equal to the focal length. In other words, if I had a 50 millimeter lens that had an opening that was 50 millimeters in diameter, because it's the diameter then 50 over 50 is 1. But if you look at a lens set at F2, you will find that the effective opening is 25 millimeters. So that makes sense. So the lens is a 50 millimeter lens. Yep. At F2, the aperture is mm -hmm. opened to one half, 1 over 2 of 50 or 25 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Correct. Why do you now, never see an F1 lens? Is there, Are there such uh. things? Yeah, th yeah, there is. If and you're made of money? There's actually, yeah, there's actually, I've actually seen a 0.63 lens. Wow. wow. What's the bokeh look like on that? <laughs> that's big. <laughs> and there's no big depth of bokeh. field at all. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one thing people should be aware of. I mean, uh, the fastest lens in my kit is that very nice Canon 50 oh, millimeter 1.2. 1 mm -hmm. yep. But you have to be, if you're going to shoot at that, if you're going to open it up all that way, you have to focus very carefully. Yeah. And you're going to have that problem you talked about with portraiture. If I focus on her eyes, yeah, her ears catches, yeah. are going to be out of focus. Yeah. All you're going to see is eyes and blah. At, at F1, too, if you focused on, you know, if you got your focus wrong, you'd focus on the eyelashes and then the pupils would be out. You'd see nothing. It's that close. So yeah. we call it the focal, or Ray calls it, the focal plane. Which is, if you remember your geometry, mm -hmm. a plane is a flat surface. It's how deep this focal plane is. The wider open the lens is, the shallower the focal plane. Mm -hmm. So if these are her eyelashes and this is her eyes, the eyelashes are focused, the eyes aren't. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you if you go to a larger opening, you get a, a, this is where I get confused. Larger opening, smaller focal plane. And a pinhole uh, camera. F number. F number. And the pinhole camera, which is F16 or 22, is very tiny or maybe even more. Mm -hmm. That has a focal plane that is almost infinite, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. The The pinhole camera has an infinite depth of field, more or less. But it, it, by the way, now let, let me point out, you never win on these things. There's always a trade-off. So somebody says, well, hey, let's just stop down. You know, in fact, there was a group way back in the 20s and 30s, and I think Edward Weston was in this group, called the F-64 Club. Mm. And, uh, you know, the idea was we just stop this thing down and we have everything in focus from, you know, three inches to uh, infinity. But it turns out that when you stop a lens down, 
the things that are in sharp focus in the focal plane become more blurry. Okay, now wait a minute. <laughs> so if I go to F64, yep. everything's in focus. Well, the every you have a greater depth of field. Oh, but not but, everything's in focus. But the thing that is right in the focal plane is not as sharp as it would be at F8 or F4 Interesting. or F2. So the reason the, the reason it's important to know this, to talk about this, it does seem awfully technical. Mm -hmm. But it's something you're going to play with. These are settings you're going to modify to get an effect that you want. Yeah, I'm going to be honest and say that I didn't know this when I started. and Sometimes um, just doing it by trial and error is, yeah, is and good. Yeah, and I think the best way to get started with playing with shallow depth of field is to... Um, instead of shooting on, you know, auto mode or picture mode, if you test out the um, aperture priority mode, um, which is actually on um, most DS, well, on, on DSLRs, but also on a lot of point Many shoots. Many point and shoots. My Lumix LX5 does it, the S95 Canon, the G12 mm -hmm. Canon. Uh, and what, what aperture priority mode does is it allows you to set your aperture so you can decide... You know, if I'm taking a picture of a flower and I want the flower in focus and everything else to be blurred, you know, I would choose, you know, F2. And then the camera is going to figure out the shutter speed and the ISO. So if you don't, if you're not comfortable in using a manual setting, then, you know, try aperture priority. And then, you know, obviously you're going to run into problems where your picture is going to be too dark or too light because the camera's not necessarily smart enough to figure that out so you can compensate using like exposure like exposure compensation right. and go one up or one down or ray, ray when i when ray taught me a little bit about photography and i don't blame him for anything that i took <laughs> later but <laughs> when i first got a good camera and I, and I talked to ray about it he he told me to shoot in aperture priority mode most of the time mm -hmm. and uh so one of the first things i do now when i get a canon my a new canon or a new a new uh slr is I, I, I put it in aperture priority mode and I change the focusing to point focus. Ray told me that too. And that's because I'm going to be shooting with a shallow depth of field more often. And right. so I want to know exactly what's in focus. I don't want to let the camera use a bunch of zones. Mm -hmm. I want to focus, say, on your eyes, mm -hmm. get that red dot on there, focus it, mm -hmm. and then know that that's going to be in focus. So and keep it keep in mind there that once you use that centermost square and get the, the camera to focus... Then you can shift after you're holding the uh, shutter release halfway down in most cameras. It's it you know it captures the focus and then it freezes and now you can shift to compose the shot. In other words, you don't have to have mm. the uh, thing that you want in sharpest sharpest focus in the center of the picture. You, you usually don't, in fact. Yeah, you know, right. exactly. Use the golden rule of golden mean. Golden mean. Yeah. So actually, you'll see a lot of times if you watch a pro taking pictures, they'll do a funny thing. They'll go. J -j and then take the picture. So what they're doing is they're focusing, moving, recomposing, mm -hmm. and then shooting. And right. one of the beautiful things about uh, the iPhone and some of the newer point and shoots where you have touch to focus Love that. is you don't have to you know how to do that. It. You literally just like press exactly where you want the focus to be, and that's where it's, it's going to be. And obviously... Um, Let me go back a couple of shots because uh, there's some good shots in here uh, that... Are really illustrate exactly what we were uh, just talking about. I, I put together an album. Oh, called, did you? Called Shallow Depth of. Oh, let me let me go to the mostly my, Lisa's uh, on my Flickr. Flickr. Um, so there are times when you want to shoot shutter priority. You don't want to shoot aperture priority. If you're shooting uh, out of a car window and it's and you're going 80 miles an hour, or you're shooting a sports event, there's plenty of times when you don't want aperture priority when you yeah, want to choose mean, a faster shutter speed. There. You'll definitely have problems just shooting an aperture priority where you will. It'll be too dark um, and, the, you know, it just won't get it right. right. And that's when you want to switch to manual. But I think when you're just when you're just starting out, it's it's a great way to explore depth of field. Um, I mean, a good project is just getting, you know, a, a cup of coffee and setting it, you know, sort of in front of your frame and then, you know, take try 
taking a shot at, at F2, at F8. But just at, experiment. Just experiment with that. And, you know, you'll, you'll get, get to get a feel of, of what shallow depth of field looks like and what, you know, everything in focus looks like and sort of find like the, the sweet spot of, of your lens. These are all of Lisa's shallow depth of field uh, shots. Some of them, uh, as you can see, uh, with with uh, models, some of them with objects. There's some beautiful bokeh. There. There's your pup. Hey, that's Ozzy. <laughs> <laughs> animals are, are great for this because... Uh, if you can keep them still, <laughs> animals are great for it's, this. Well, people often, when they take animal pictures, don't get those eye shots. They don't get that animal... You know, I think, yeah. And it really does make a difference if you can get an animal to look like they're posing. <laughs> it's great. This is a, it's a good example of depth. Definitely. Of and, and when you're shooting portraits. Um, That's it's, a good one. Let me go back. Just, just, I don't really want to talk about comp. You were talking about composition and you don't want stuff in the middle. The focal point on this shot, this is a great comp. Com oh. From a composition point of view, because the focal point, of course, is that drop, mm -hmm. which is not in the center of the picture. I think a lot of times, amateurs especially, they'll put it right I, in the I always shoot with um, grid mode on my camera, mm -hmm. and it really allows me to to compose my shots. And, you know, people toss around, like, rule of thirds a lot. So, And that's usually on the camera what the grid mode is. But we've talked before, and we're going to talk more. Yeah. And Ray's going to talk about this. I could tell. Yeah, I know. Really, the He's rule just chomping at the The bit. rule of thirds is wrong, and I think we're going to. We won't go into great detail here, Ray, because I think that that's that. Co Composition is a total. Let's get you on uh, again for that one, because it really. But you know, I just want to throw in one more thing. I love it that the drop is the point of focus, but the eye follows lines, and yes. then I follow that blade of grass down. Mm -hmm. And then I follow the other blade of grass up. And this picture is great at drawing the eye. And that's what depth of field does. It, yeah, it really does. Um, it, especially with macros and portraits, you can really um, craft the photo to be what you want, want to focus on. If you're shooting at F8 and you're shooting a portrait, everything's going to be in focus. So if you have a model positioned in front of, you know, any sort of foliage, a there, bush or a tree, the details you're, yeah, you're going to have all that mess. I mean, that picture, if I would have taken it in focus, would have looked like a giant mess of grass. Right. And that's what it was. But by blurring out the background, you're able to just focus on what, what you want the picture to be about. So this is a perfect example of using this. You've got the the first thing you, that you draws the eye, which is that perfect drop, which is a perfect focus mm -hmm. in the perfect place, draws the eye over, then the lines pull it down. Mm -hmm. And you as a photographer have used depth of field and selective focus mm -hmm. to tell the viewer what to look at. Lisa has also used another compositional trick here uh that i just might mention that has to do with uh, culture the culture we're from and other places in the world might be different you'll notice that that blade of grass leads in from left to right ah. mm. and that's because we read left to right in the western world and so you know if you reverse that picture it would be disturbing it would you'd be going <laughs> the wrong way yeah and to be honest i i changed like i think that that blade of grass was not at that angle like <laughs> i i changed it i mean that one thing i do with my i i'm i'm i manipulate almost all my photos to like in post to be exactly what i want them to be compositionally because you don't always get the perfect shot right out of the camera i mean you can try but i was like lying in the grass <laughs> like on a mat and you know i couldn't necessarily get that perfect angle but you know um but that's something. composition I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we won't spend a lot of time on composition, but just to show you how depth of field, selective focus, and bokeh can be combined, really all coming from the same idea of shooting at a selected aperture to give you the effect mm -hmm. you're looking for to make it a really remarkable a picture. And uh, and if you have to edit the blade of grass to get it, the right <laughs> angle, go right ahead. It's perfectly okay. Photoshop and Lightroom are valid tools. Go for it. <laughs> They're your buddies. Yes. You bet. Ray Maxwell, uh, I can't point people to a web page because he, he doesn't want anybody to go there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what you can do. You what? can, if you want to see some of my photos. We do, we do, we do. You can go to photo.net slash photos 
slash Raymax, and the R and the M must be capitals. So that's the last part is Raymax, R A Y M A X, R and M must be capitals, and there you are. Ray is just uh, technically and artistically unbelievable. And it's always fun to see uh, Ray's shots. And Ray, thank you for coming on. So Ray will be a regular on this show from time to time. Not necessarily every week, but that's pure Ansel Adams, by the way. <laughs> to uh, explain uh, some of the more interesting technical concepts. This is this is the first one of the first HDRs I ever saw. And you did that with that 22 yeah, megapixel that was leaf the back, right? Leaf back on a Hasselblad. Just Actually on a super wide Hasselblad. The detail in this, uh, I've seen the print of this, and it's uh, unbelievable. You know, that's what I was going to say. One of our complimentary things here is I am a printmaker primarily, and uh, Lisa is primarily an electronic publisher. She's so already said she doesn't print them. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, it's, so it's, you know, our skills are very complimentary yeah. in that regard. Yeah. Ray, thank you so much for joining us. Sure thing. Ray Maxwell, maybe we'll get you on and find out what's in your bag, but we're going to find out what's in Lisa's camera kit right now. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Take care. All righty. Bye-bye. That's fine. I think, I think that's clear. I think I hope everybody understands that. I mean, yeah. I'm, I mean trying it, to, I'm trying to wrap my head around it as we talk. It, it's something that sort of comes to you gradually. I mean, I certainly did not know the technical anything like when i started i just experiment like, though That's like i said i just um i i started when i f my first lens was the 50 millimeter 1.4 so i knew automatically you know oh wow if i shoot at 1.4 things look amazing yeah and well, it's it's pretty incredible if you have been shooting on on a point and shoot to go to some a lens like that where you can literally take a picture of a doorknob and make it look yeah. <laughs> artistic yeah and you suddenly are controlling the viewer's eye, yeah. and if you and if you you may not. I had the same experience when I first got a DSLR because I'd never mm -hmm. experienced shallow depth of field, yeah. which is what we're talking about. You know, focus in the foreground, out of focus in the background, drawing the viewer's eye. Mm -hmm. And the first time I took a picture and I looked at it, I didn't know why, but I said, "Wow, that looks pretty good." Yeah, <laughs> looks like a pro took it, and that's <laughs> yeah. that's the thing that you may not be conscious of that often distinguishes mm -hmm. professionals from the uh, amateurs. Really neat. All right. I'll get my gear. Get your gear out. <laughs> we hope to get many uh, great photographers on this show showing us what they use. Uh, this is partly for the drool factor because, uh, you know, oh, okay. especially the pros, they spend a lot of money on this gear. But also to find out what people find useful because you can spend a lot of money and not find something that's useful. First of all, tell me about the bag you use. It's a big bag. Eek. It's a gigantic bag. Yes. This is the... The... Uh, Low Pro Compu Trekker. I have that bag too. It holds a laptop and about everything. The problem with but it camera weighs bags five hundred pounds. Uh, oh, I know. The problem with camera bags is finding one um, if you are carrying a laptop, which I usually am. Um, so when I travel, I usually carry two different bags. So I have um, one bag where I carry that I actually carry on as carry on into the plane. Um, which is something like this that holds all my gear because there's no way I'm, <laughs> I'm letting them take it away from me. <laughs> I, it's, yeah, I mean, they always try, but I, I always persist. I have a Pelican case for that reason. It's one of those hard shell uh, yes. cases, and I use that, uh, but still carry it on. But at least it's protected. If I had to check it, I guess I could live with it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, I had this bag in Australia. I took everything in this bag. And right. It's very heavy, but... Um, okay, so... Let's get this out of the way so we can see. There, your camera is right there, just so you know, right here. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so inside... Oh, this is the, uh, the strap that I was telling you about, the, the Black Rapid. Um, Tony Wang gave me this strap. Here, just give, hand it to me so I can show this people. This is the girly version, though. Well, what's interesting <laughs> about this is it isn't a camera strap that um, hooks on to your... Uh, those, the things on your camera, yeah, the sides it actually of your camera, screws in the bottom. It, it goes right in the bottom of the, the tripod mount, which is both good and bad. Uh, it's bad because if you want to use a tripod, you have to unscrew it first. Yeah, that's true. But it gives it, a, it's very solid. Some people have complained that perhaps it's, it's stressing the case. I think a good camera, it's not going to hurt the case. Well, yeah. But then, I mean, look what you can do that I love about this. It's like a, you feel like a samurai. <laughs> Seriously. Because your camera, your camera is you, you put it around like this, yeah. and the camera's on this 
thing. And this is a slidey thing. Actually, I've got it on backwards because you've got the stop on that side. So you, you put a, uh, you have a little stop mm -hmm. so it won't go backwards too far. But then you slide this up. The camera slides up. So if it's attached to the camera, you've got it at your hip. I love this. Yeah, the, the only downside stuff. is if you are carrying um, a yeah, camera, camera with a big lens. Yeah, then it's banging around. Then it's banging around. Well, watch this. Boom. <laughs> See, this doesn't move. Yeah. It slides. And I think that that's, I like it. I do too, yeah. 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 Um, so that's fairly inexpensive. It is. And it doesn't say Canon 5D Mark II. Yeah, it II. doesn't say steal me. It doesn't say steal me on it. So and that that's the there is a a more manly version. Um, there's, I'll bring my manly version in next I, time. I had I had one that <laughs> where I could put my iPhone in it, but it was just way too bulky. So they this have one, a little uh, pouch in the front, yeah, for memory. That's or, a, the black rapid. Um, my main lenses. Um, I have the the fifty one four on so my. That body we should say is what a Canon five D Mark II. This is a II? Canon five D Mark II. Okay. You and I both shoot. Canons. Canon, like Canons. Yes. There are very good Nikons. We don't hate Nikons. We, no. There are very good Sonys. There's lots of brands. We just happen to shoot <laughs> um, this particular one. I shoot most of my portraits on the 85 uh, 1.8. And this is a great. So, just for people who are new, that's 85 millimeters. That's the focal length. Yes. And, and 1.8, is. remember we talked about 1 over 1.8. That's yes. the widest, the, the, the fastest it can go. It can never get faster than that. Right. So, you know, when you have apertures of, you know, the, like better glass generally has lower Lower aperture. numbers. Yeah. Wider, wider open. And this, now, why 80, 85? 85 is, is, um, is a really great lens for a full frame camera to do portraits. Because you're not in people's no faces. Right. And obviously, um, when you're, when you have sort of a wider angle lens, you get a lot of sort of fisheye, fish People bowling. do not like it when you they take... They do not look good. Because their noses get really yes, big. Yes, it's, it's not good at all. And even the 50 on a full frame camera isn't great. Really? 50 okay. on a crop sensor. Right. Um, so like a, a Rebel camera. I mean, Because it's really effectively a 75 or 80. I mean, it's a longer. Yes. So I don't think we want to go too deep on this one. <laughs> But uh, when we are talking about lengths right now, let's just say we're true talking about true length, yeah. not the effective length that you might get on a camera with a smaller sensor. Right. So 50 millimeter it kind of matches the eye. It's kind of, they say roughly what well, you 30, see. 35. 35? But then obviously if you, yeah, a crop sensor, you're going to have, it's going to be quite a different There's feel. a multiplier on a, crop, on a right. smaller sensor. So but when, let's say we're just talking about 85, true 85. Mm-hmm. Or even even a hundred sometimes it's okay to be a little bit long on a portrait lens so that you don't have to be. Oh, right definitely, in your face. and and the, the features flatten out. The worst thing in portraiture is if you have when where the nose is big and that's that's bad. Right. <laughs> so that's that's my main portrait lens. Um, I just got the uh, twenty four to seventy L lens. That's a zoom lens that starts at 24 millimeters, which yeah. is a little bit wide. Yeah. It's, Not distortion wide. This but is a sort bit of a, a really great um, event photography lens. Because so you is, can get slightly telephoto, slightly wide to slightly telephoto. I mean, you still have to be fairly close to your subject. So you couldn't stand right at the back of the room if you were, say, photographing, um, a, you know, a conference or something. Right. But or, or penguins. Or penguins. I, I found that when it comes to penguins, a longer <laughs> lens is a good idea. Definitely. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't gotten into the zoom. I mean, people are surprised I don't have a 70 to 200, but it's it's mainly just because of the weight. I mean, I it's do. too big. I, I do have, um, you know. An, so how fast is that? It's a 2.8. And, and because it's a high quality L lens, that means it's 2.8 across the whole range. Yes. I mean, this is, yeah, this is a beautiful lens. It's heavy, though. People warned me about that, and I found that I didn't want to lug it around when I was actually, um, you know, taking shots, like, out in London or whatever. It's but actually heavier than the kit lens, the 24-105 that comes with yes, it. Yes, it's, it's, it's heavy. It's a beast. It's, um, it's, it's good glass. But it is, yeah, it is a good... Uh, I The uh, kit lens that comes with the 5D is 24 to 24-105. Four. Yeah. That's why it's lighter. It's yeah. it's a slower lens. So mm -hmm. often lenses that are faster are heavier because they have more bigger definitely bigger glass, more optics. And then um, I also have the 100 uh, millimeter macro 2.8 
L. They came out with that after I bought mine. Oh, yeah, I know. Because I got one <laughs> that was like 185 mil. It's really long. Yeah, so this, this is That's great. a little bit more portable. Yeah, this is, yeah. Um, I honestly, I got this for portraits as well. I haven't used it for that purpose. It's it's a beautiful lens um, and definitely uh, sort of a must if you're a macro photographer. So that's what you've taken shots like this uh, with. Those are, that, that are was actually the telephoto? Okay. 50, I okay. think. Um, that looks like a 50. That's yeah. a macro probably, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. Really? I, I just got this, so I honestly haven't. You don't have a lot of pictures. I don't either. have. That's yeah. probably it. Yeah. So it. a macro moment. is a macro because well, this is a this has to be a macro shot. A macro is a macro yes. because it can take a picture that is effectively the same size as the actual object. It's a yes, one and you can get to really, one ratio, really close. So if you're taking a picture of a bug that's three inches long in real life, it's three inches long on the photo. Yep. That that requires a special kind of lens called a macro. So there's that one. And then sort of my favorite travel lens is the... Um, I use that a lot, too. <laughs> is the 16 to 35. Most of um, my shots in Machu Picchu and stuff. This was there. this was my first purchase. My Very first, first lens. <laughs> I know, my first L lens. Um, I rented it. I can't, I can't even tell you how many times, probably 10 times before I bought it. And it's, it's definitely um, one of my favorites. It's a great lens for taking architecture pictures and landscapes and sort of crazy, you know, fish-eyed shots. And I mean, it's so sharp and so clear and it's, it's really, really light. It's a great lens to just have on your camera for street photography as well. That's a really good tip, by the way, is that uh, all of these lenses can be rented pretty cheaply. Yes. Yes. And, and, and um, before Camera Plus, when I was... <laughs> broke <laughs> i i rented all my lenses in fact i only i only um had the 50 and the kit lens for the first two years of my photography career so i would and rent. you took great pictures so. and yeah and um don't feel like you have to spend a lot of money yeah for sure you can rent all these lenses borrow lenses you had the t1 for a long time didn't you the yeah. es rebel yeah. yeah and we're very happy with it <laughs> and i was very happy with it um so I have two flashes, uh, the um, the 580EX and the 430EX. There's a, One is a TTL, which means through the lens. Yes. and That's um, what you want if you can afford it. This is the old one. Yeah. It works just fine. Yeah. <laughs> I never got the TTL. I really... Scott Bourne was the one who said, oh, you got to get TTL because then it meters through the lens and you get a better result. Yeah. yeah. And, and and so I use this for uh, if I'm shooting event photography, I'll just uh, slip on an Omni bounce and that will help diffuse the light so you don't get We may crazy. cover that on our next show, event. Uh, yeah. No, doing that, event photography. I event photography fun. for yeah. sure. By which you mean concerts, uh, conferences, Weddings, uh, weddings, that kind of uh, thing. Parties okay. or uh, whatever. Um, and I also have my um, Alien B cyber sync triggers so that I can shoot um, off camera flash as well. Tell me well. about those. So these um, are so, little transmitters. Yep. Yeah, so um, you have your transmitter that goes on your camera. Actually, it goes on this one. And then um, you have the receiver bit that your flash sits on. And then, because these are the older models and they're Canon, I have to use a, a PC cable to plug them in. But essentially, this allows me to... Put the flash somewhere else. Yeah, so... Instead of on the camera, this is one of the problems with camera flashes. They're right above the lens. So they bounce off the person right into the lens. Yeah, bad. And it's not diffuse, it's not uh, natural, it's just bright. So, uh, you know, a way... Most of my portraits are shot either through a, sh uh, a, a large shoot-through umbrella. Is that like, for instance, this photo was... Yep, that was 
one shoot through umbrella. That's diffusing the light. That's diffusing light. And, and also, it's off camera. It's not right in front of the yes, camera. Yes, so it's, it would be on a stand. On her side, on the side, this side. You can see the lighting. Her face is more modeled because it's darker on the right-hand side and lighter on the light-hand side. That means the light was somewhere over here. And that's what you wanted. It gives you texture and depth. Yep. What else have I got in my bag? Do you use a white balance card or anything like that? No. No, me neither. If you're um, shooting raw, you can always balance it later. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of uh, a fix it in post. I used to be very, um, it, I used to be pretty serious about my white balance, but now I know I'm going to change it afterwards, right. probably. Right. Um, I use, this is my ridiculously expensive um, That's time it. timer. <laughs> so that is... Uh, it's wired. It's a yeah, it's a it's a wired shutter release, but it also has you can set. Um, you could say you take a picture in a minute. Yeah, take a take a picture every three seconds for. Oh, so you could do time time lapse. Time lapse. This was my intention. I was going to shoot a, a time lapse from my window for a year or something. Oh, did you? The, well, then I realized I need my camera. <laughs> <laughs> you can't move. I it. need another camera. No, and that, you can't that move wasn't it. Stuck happen. there. But. Um, you know, this one was uh, something ridiculous, like $150 or something, but you can just get a cheap one or like a wireless trigger um, for for something fairly fairly cheap. I have a wired trigger, and I, it was so hard. I was taking pictures of myself in the boat, and I'd have to reach over and go like this, <laughs> and it just get a wireless. It's so much easier yeah, to do self-portraits if you get a wireless. It is. Um, I also carry uh, some video gear with me. Um, I have. We should say that the 5D Mark II is an excellent video it is camera an as well. Video and I should have it. So you bring uh, one of these light panel uh, micros with you. Yes, I do. These awesome. are great. I love these. This is great. Battery um, powered. These are just regular alkaline batteries. So I use that because sometimes I, I sh I'll shoot video. I actually got this in the mail today. It's a new um, road video. Ah. Uh, now I use, uh, I use uh, a road. Doesn't look like that. It has a big kitten on it. I know this. It's their stereo mic. This is more of a shotgun. I think it is a shotgun, and it's it's perfect. Um, the other one that I I I used to have the I have the same one you do the stereo video stereo mic. Yeah, yeah. Um, was a lot bigger, and, and it has didn't... a big fuzzy kitten on it. <laughs> it and they never they fit call it, into my. They call it a dead kitten, <laughs> but it's what it's that big fuzzy puff ball on there. Yeah. So I haven't even I haven't even tried this, but oh cool. But it's it's gonna probably live in my kit. The that. mic, the built-in mic on on most cameras is not very good. So, uh, the five D, like many cameras, has a little mini jack. And if you buy a microphone that uses a mini jack, or you have a beach deck or some it sort of interface, it considerably improves the improvement. sound. Big improvement. Considerably. Yep. Other than that, just spare batteries and. Whatnot. How many batteries you carry with you? Usually lots. Yeah, me too. I have some snoots in here. What's a snoot? <laughs> a snoot actually directs the. Um, a flash. Okay, so, so you, you put stick the flash, a flash into in it. here. So flash will just blast out right. in every which direction, and this actually uh, directs directs the flash. Those look like a homemade snoot. <laughs> yeah, I actually learned. This is one of my first um, DIY projects that I learned from a strobist. Will you do a snoot <laughs> class for us? Because I need a snoot. Show you me. Show me what. It, so you put that on the flash. Yeah. And it's like a trumpet. It is. It directs. Um, there's a tutorial. How would you on use strobus. it? What would you use it for? Well, say I had this one does Yeah, so something it's like It's a tight that. snoot. It's a, the snoot's too tight. <laughs> I think this the snoot wasn't very well crafted. But anyways, yeah, it would sit it on your It's probably for a different flash. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um yeah. so yeah, it'll sit on there and direct. But say I wanted um I was taking a, a picture of a model and I just wanted say a spotlight. Right. Like, say I was taking a really artsy picture of, like, her lips and, like, a ring in her lips or something. And, right. and then I would just direct the the light towards that. There's so many great tutorials on Strobist. Um, We're going to get him on. Yeah. He's a fan. He's a viewer. Uh, not of this show, necessarily. He probably thinks we're stupid. I'm, yeah. I'm very self-conscious doing this show because there's so many I good know. photographers out there. <laughs> But look, we're Criticizing doing this. Criticizing us. Yeah, no, it's okay. We're taking a hit for you because we just, uh, we love this. It's such a great hobby. It is so much fun. For somebody like Lisa, it's obviously a little more than a hobby. Uh, but it, you know, it started out just, just for and fun. That's, and uh, that's, uh, I guess, our word of warning. This stuff can start out <laughs> simple and get very addictive very fast. And then you get fast. addicted. But what a great hobby. What a great hobby. 
And I, yeah, I just want to make sure people like, obviously I've got all this now, but I started out with, with nothing and, you know, started taking pictures on like a, a three megapixel Canon point and shoot. Right. And, you know, I went back and in, in preparation for the show and looked back at some of my old photos and it really gave me perspective. Um, but what it did teach me is like the passion was always there. And I really yeah. think that you can like all this technical stuff, if it's not your bag and, and honestly, it's not my um, bag to like know everything. But right. um, I mean, obviously I have to know it now because sort of dependent on it, but um, to just explore photography, you can. It's kind of fun when it's just a hobby, isn't it? Yeah. It's much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't go, don't go pro on us. So, uh I think that we have now a few things that we would like to do in future episodes. We're mm -hmm. going to get more photographers to show us what's in their kit. I'll bring my bag next time. We can talk a little bit about some of the yeah. weird stuff that I carry. Because <laughs> uh, mostly I have the same stuff as you do. I don't have any snoots. You need a snoot. Yeah, it's a cereal box. Snoots. Really? Is that all? A cereal is? box and gaffer's tape. I think there we're going to so have many, a snoot making class. So many things you can do with gaffer's tape. We also want your pictures so we can show off your pictures. Cause, uh, and we're going to have contests. We absolutely will. In fact, cash prices. So stay I, tuned yeah, for I guess that. I guess um, we do have a Flickr group. I think it's fairly sad right now, but we're just starting. Well, we just started it. It should be sad. <laughs> but I but I I guess I want to encourage everyone to try to take some shallow depth of field photos this week. Good. Um, Good you know, assignment. Try. You can try macros or portraits or whatever sort of strikes your fancy. Try to try get some some bokeh. If you've got your your Christmas lights still out, and I know some people still do, <laughs> you can try to do some shots like that. Excellent. So there you have it. Mostly photo beta two is beta two. in the developing is in the bath. <laughs> Thanks to Ray Maxwell for joining us. Uh, you can see Ray's uh, photos on photo.net slash photogs slash capital R-A-Y, capital M-A-X. Great stuff if you haven't seen his stuff. He's just a wonderful photographer. He'll be back, as will many other great photographers. Chris Marquardt's going to join us in future episodes and more. And we're thinking, and uh, we'd love your feedback on this, of doing this show. Uh, we'll start doing the show on Tuesdays. Maybe not next Tuesday, but uh, a week we'll from Tuesday. We'll be at South By. Yeah, a week from Tuesday. Uh, we Or maybe it's... Anyway, uh, uh, we're thinking at around 1 p.m. Tuesdays, if that works for everybody live and uh yes i did get it wrong macro is the same size on the sensor not on right. the print uh, same size on the sensor as the picture you're taking is that right i don't know <laughs> it's been a long day i got up early okay people <laughs> this is your normal normal get up time i was up late watching zombie movies I'm were you really yeah which one um, monsters. Mm. It's good. I hate zombies. Really? They keep coming and coming at you, even though they oh, don't they were aliens. Fast. Oh, aliens. Aliens. I don't mind aliens so much. <laughs> it's zombies I don't like. Ah. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Mostly Photo. Thank you, everyone.